right, we are live. Welcome to another Breach Report. We are very excited. We have a special guest, Sumit Balkil, and we're going to be talking about supply chain and what organizations should know about it, what they can do to protect themselves if they're a part of it in any way. And so, Sumit, very excited, very excited to have you as a guest. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here, be a part of this discussion. Awesome. And let me do a quick, let me do a quick introduction on, on Sumit. Um, he's the chief product officer and co-founder of Resilink. As a CPO, um, Sumit is responsible for the product and technology vision direction delivery. He has over 25 years experience bringing innovative technologies to the market, and he has served in many leadership roles. Uh, both in product and engineering. He's been successfully part of many startups and Fortune 500 companies such as Cisco and Brocade. And he was named in 2022 Pro to Know by Supply and Demand Chain Exec Magazine. So that is amazing. And I also, Sumi, I did a Google search on you and I was impressed to find, this is what it said about you. It's one of, you're one of the world's leading experts in internet data security and you're a holder of several patents in the area. So I had it right there on Google. I thought that was pretty neat. I wanted to share that. So welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to have you part of the show. And I'm very excited to be here. And thank you for having me on the show. So for, for someone that's listening in that maybe isn't so familiar with, with supply chain, how would you explain supply chain and just kind of break it down for someone that's kind of new to it, I'm sure we might have some experts listening. But if, if you were to just say, "Hey, this is a, a, someone that's that's inter being introduced to it," mm -hmm. how would you explain that? Sure. So I think the the best way to uh, think about supply chains or, or to to talk about supply chains in this context then would be uh, a manufacturing example. So let's take an automotive uh, industry uh, company, right? Uh, pick any one of the big car companies that you think of. Um, they themselves run manufacturing plants where the cars are assembled. But if you actually look at the components that go into making the car, your entertainment system, the cup holder, um, even the badge, the, the, you know, the company logo that goes on, the, the tires, the rims, they all come from a variety of different other companies. Right? These are the suppliers that supply uh, those components to the car manufacturer who then assembles everything together. Now, if you take any one of those uh, suppliers, um, let's say the, the supplier that makes the uh, infotainment system, and you open up that infotainment system, it's in a, a piece of electronics. It's a computer for our, all practical purposes. It's got a screen, it's got a, a processor, it's got memory, et cetera. Each and every single one of those components also comes from a, another set of suppliers. You take any one of those chips now, you open it up, um, the ingredients that go into making the chips, uh, those come from a whole set of other suppliers. The wafer fabrication that goes into making a chip, the cutting of the, of the wafer, the packaging, the testing, all goes through a whole host of different suppliers worldwide. Um, so uh, when you think of supply chains, think of it that way. The company that you uh, as a consumer or as an organization might be buying from, um, is the one that's selling to you, yes, but they are also dependent on all these thousands of suppliers, whether they do business with them directly or those suppliers are deeper in, in the supply chain, all that coming together is your global supply chain. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So thanks for breaking that down. Now, t t tell us a little bit about your company that you helped co-found and where does it fit into the supply chain and, and what services and products is it offering? to help supply chains out. Okay, so uh, Resilink is a market leader in supply chain resiliency and risk management solutions. Um, so we provide software and data that enable our customers to uh, build supply chains that are resilient to disruptions. So let me back up a little bit, right? Um, yeah. um, our CEO and co-founder, Bindia, uh, she's a supply chain risk expert, by the way, of uh, MIT and Cisco. Um, well, back so, in yeah, that's a pedigree. <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty strong category. And before that, also, she spent a number of years in supply chain at companies like uh, Broadcom and Flextronics, uh, Selectron back then, which got acquired. Now, uh, back in 2010, she had this vision of making global supply chains resilient, sustainable, fair, and secure. 
Um, and uh, we came together, we translated her vision into Razzlink. And uh, you know, uh, like I was saying, we provide software and data solutions that enable companies to build robust and sustainable supply chains. Um, yeah. What's really interesting about how we did it is we built this network of networks of manufacturing companies. So think social network, but for supply chains. Um, companies that join our network they can securely share data with their customers or, and or their suppliers. Now, leveraging the data that uh, their suppliers may provide they themselves and good resonant provides our partners provide and using the decision-making systems that we have implemented, companies are now able to quantify risks in their supply chains, proactively mitigate them, and equally importantly, put the right people and processes in place. So should a supply chain disruption actually happen, they are there, they are able to mitigate it. And uh, ultimately uh, what they achieve is, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, revenue protection, customer sat improvement, um, um, brand protection, and also um, we help them control costs in terms of expedite ship and uh, uh, inventory management as well. Excellent. So, so with this network, I like how you uh, that that illustration of the social network. So, if if I'm getting this right, if I'm reliant on my supply chain, but now my supply chain is broken for a reason, I can then find another supply chain source a lot easier and quicker. Correct. And in, in fact, uh, what we actually advise our customers to do is not wait till the disruption happens, but take advantage of the analytics um, that uh, uh, of the risk quantification in the multi-year supply chain and proactively take action. So if you see a supplier that has higher risk, let's say um, they have a higher risk because of uh, where they are uh, you know, geographically located. Maybe it's right. high hurricane risk, maybe it's a geopolitical risk, then take action today and quantify an alternate supplier. Uh, qualify an alternate supplier, uh, establish business relationships with them, um, you know, start giving them some business. So you are well positioned should your primary supplier go down, uh, you know, you have an alternate that can take over. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes me, for some reason, I'm thinking of Sriracha sauce because they were off the shelves for so long because they couldn't get the peppers. They probably should have had some alternate sources of, of the chili pepper that they needed long before the sriracha sauce wasn't available. I don't know if you saw that, but sriracha sauce yeah. was going for like a hundred bucks on eBay and stuff. It was crazy. Yes, one of my favorite condiments. It was tough those few months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they're back on the shelves. I think I saw them back on the shelves, but no yeah. doubt they're, yeah. they're probably. I I can't even imagine how many millions of dollars were lost yeah. uh due to that due to that thing that happened there with with, yeah. their, with their supplier so let me ask you because cybersecurity is such a big thing in the landscape and obviously we're in the cybersecurity space we're always trying to look ahead supply chain and cyber attacks can you tell a little bit of more information on what you've seen in the industry from cybersecurity risk have there been any outages what what's going on with cybersecurity in the supply chain world yeah so uh, let me start with a, a couple of uh, uh, you know things uh, uh, hacks that had happened recently to kind of set the the context of what is possible right well, unfortunately what is possible with supply chains so uh, let's start with um, uh, february of last year so in february of 2022 um, uh, you can look this up kojima industries so Kojima Industries is a Toyota supplier in Japan. Um, they were hit by a cyber attack, it was ransomware, um, and uh, they were shut down. And because of the way uh, Toyota suppliers connect to it, right? Uh, Toyota has this very famous Kanban system of manufacturing. Um, so their suppliers are all directly connected to Toyota. Um, the supplier goes down, it's not able to provide the, um, uh, you know, uh, the components that Toyota procures from them. So 14 different Toyota plants across Japan shut down for an entire day. That mm -hmm. impacted the production of 13,000 automobiles. Uh, think about that, right? Um, if you even assume like a million dollar, uh, sorry, a thousand dollars per uh, car as a, a Toyota's profit, uh, we're immediately looking at a $13 million hit right there one day. Um, 
more recently, just in August, uh, Clorox, um, they got hit by a cybersecurity uh, a breach as well, uh, right? And now uh, they are reporting that they expect a 23 to 28% de decrease in net sales at the end of Q3. Wow. A quarter percent, right? A quarter percent decrease in net sales. So this is the kind of impact that supply chain disruptions because of cybersecurity can cause to your manufacturing and hence to your, uh, you know, to your revenue and customer sat. That's huge. And I would imagine that a company like Toyota or Clorox, uh, it might put the relationship on, on a rock in a rocky place after that happened, because they were, they suffered financial consequences from that supplier. And now they may say, Hey, we might need to, look at some alternatives, or maybe we want you guys to offset the cost of our loss in some way on our next negotiation. I, I would just imagine those type of conversations are happening. For sure, right? When, when supply chain organizations are assessing suppliers, right? Whether it's uh, uh, to do business with them for the first time or whether they are renewing contracts, a whole host of parameters go into assessing that supplier's performance. Um, quality, pricing, those are the more traditional metrics, but certainly things like on-time delivery, also a traditional metric, um, uh, uh, you know, supplier reliability, uh, increasingly, um, you know, suppliers' ability to, uh, uh, to continue, uh, uh, you know, delivery of the committed material uh, under stress, right, disruptions and so on. All of those are factors that are assessed, uh, are used to assess the supplier performance and its award them business. So companies that are not paying attention uh, um, or companies that are paying attention but have a cybersecurity breach uh, for, a, for whatever reason, they do tend to lose business. Yeah, I, I see that. Uh, we, we recently had a customer that reached out to us because they were getting, it wasn't Toyota, but it was another very large competitor of Toyota. And they were just the attorney. They were just the, the law firm representing that automobile manufacturer. And that automobile uh, manufacturer had such stringent requirements for them mm -hmm. to even represent their case because they had sensitive data. And that kind of set the, the law firm into motion, making sure they had everything in place to even be allowed to do business. And I, I would imagine that's only going to keep getting more and more stringent in the supply chain world. They're not even part of the supply chain, but in a sense, they are a trusted vendor that's, you know, working with large manufacturing. I can only imagine yeah. what they're going to start having to do with the organizations that are actually supplying them components that they need. Yeah. And, and you know, th this is such a fantastic example of, right, what the consequence of a breach could be. Um, Yes, you could have, uh, uh, you know, uh, your manufacturing shut down. Um, but like in the case of the, the law firm, you could also have uh, IP, uh, uh, you know, leakage. You could have intellectual property that either you as a manufacturing organization own or one of your customers is interested you with it. Um, so uh, whether it's a manufacturing or a direct supplier or whether it's an indirect supplier, like a services provider, like a law firm, your supply chain could also end up causing an, an intellectual property issue for you. That makes a lot of sense. Now, as organizations are trying to strengthen their cybersecurity posture, and let's say they're part of that supply chain, what are things they could do to better their risk score, for example? So you're, you're scoring risk on a lot of different factors. What are some areas that they could be doing to give them a lower risk and therefore more likely to win business and more likely not to lose it once they have it. Because I, I would imagine if I'm a small business owner and I finally get that big contract, the last thing I ever want to do is, is lose that contract. Yeah. So uh, it, it comes down to this, uh, right? Uh, you have to be able to demonstrate to your customer that you have a robust supply chain um, and you have robust cybersecurity practices. Um, uh, you also, in addition to that, and, and look, we know this, right? If you're going to try and do business with a the company, they're going to make you fill out these uh, cybersecurity assessments. Great. 
Um, some companies are more diligent about it and they'll make you refresh them more often. Some will make you refresh them only at the uh, uh, you know time of uh, contract renewal. But regardless, you know the first thing I would say uh, to a small vendor or a large vendor even is just you know be proactive and be clear about your cybersecurity practices. Uh, if you have already identified, uh, you know, areas of improvement, start working on them. Don't wait for something to happen before you address them. So first and foremost, you know, do your own housekeeping, uh, bring your own cybersecurity practices under control. Um, and by the way, since you're a manufacturing organization, don't just focus on your IT uh, assets. Your OT, uh, you know, your operational technologies assets are equally important and more likely they they are going to be needing more attention. Um, now that you've got your house in order, that's not sufficient though. You have to start looking at your own suppliers as well because you may be okay, but if your supplier is disrupted, you're going to be disrupted, so you're not going to supply your customer. So here is where your IT diligence comes in, right? Your OT diligence comes in. It is not sufficient to collect data from your suppliers once every uh, you know contract renewal cycle. I mean, if you're setting up a three to five year contract, so much can change during that time, right? So bring in technologies that can help you automate the collection of uh, 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 you know cybersecurity practices data from your suppliers. Um, those traditional spreadsheets and, and documents that uh, we have uh, you know our vendors fill out as IT diligence go beyond that. Right, you bring in a system, and you know you can look at some of the examples Razzlink has as well. But bring in a system that will let you easily quantify, all right, where the gaps in the supplier cybersecurity practices are. Chances are you're dealing with hundreds of suppliers. You can't go after every single supplier. You need to be able to prioritize. So a system like that that helps you quickly identify areas of improvement in your supplier's uh, cyber pra uh, pra practices and lets you prioritize based on your business goals. So maybe that supplier has a, has a disproportionately large impact on your revenue. Maybe they are holding some really sensitive IT for you. Those are the suppliers you want to prioritize first. Go after them, help them uh, work with them, right? This is not about yanking the business from them and going to someone else. It is very much a cooperative thing in supply chain. Help them improve their practices, their processes, uh, make them robust, and ultimately you are the ones who are going to gain from it. So to summarize, you know, take care of your own business first and immediately look at your suppliers, help them get better. Um, you have already taken the first two important steps. And then as, uh, 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 you know, as you see more uh, maturity on your supplier side, then start working with them to go to their suppliers and then their suppliers and so on. So as deep as you can go in the supply chain. That makes a lot of sense. I like I like the systematic approach. Tell me a little bit. How did you get into this business? I, I love the business side of it as well as the cyber side. And what is you know, what was the driving factor as you kind of grew your career to this point? So uh, for me, it's it's been a pretty interesting kind of journey. Um, um, I'm going to date myself here, but I started my career as a programmer working on remote access systems. Uh, some of you may have heard of the company, US Robotics. You may remember those modems yeah. that made noise, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so I used to work on those chassis that went into, like, here's another legacy term, internet service providers is, uh, 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 you know, uh, knots. <laughs> um, so that's where I started. Uh, this was back in Chicago in the early 90s. Uh, then Silicon Valley came calling. Um, and I worked on some of the early VPN gateways um, uh, on, you know, some of the early IPsec uh, standards and, um, uh, you know, I even looked at Skipjack and a bunch of other stuff. But really, I, in the uh, late 90s, I worked on some of those early VPN gateway systems. Then I kind of transitioned into um, uh, fixed wireless. You know, we were solving for the last mile problem, then into enterprise wireless and then Ultimately, um, uh, you know, uh, I co-founded Razzlink. I, I worked mostly through startups. Um, I did spend some time at Cisco where I ended up through an acquisition, um, but the startups have always been my passion and this idea was just too good uh, to not go after.
I love that. Yeah, I I love the feeling of a startup. It's just you're, you're, there's there's so much exciting about it. I still feel like we're a startup in a lot of ways, even though we're 11 years and not necessarily yeah. considered a startup. Like we're in such hyper growth mode that as a company is expanding, they're always hitting ceilings that they have to break through and, ex, you know, yeah. creating new processes, building new relationships, new partnerships, having to do different new things. And I just find, yeah. I find it so exciting. Yeah. Everything you said there, I, I was like, I can identify with every single thing here. We have been in business for 13 years. Um, but, uh, and yeah, we're also not considered a startup anymore, but every single day it's like, you know, let's break down this problem, right? Let, let's go solve for this. Here's something new we can do. It's just amazing. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's great. It's great. Now, are you, what is the ideal customer profile for you as you're kind of expanding, obviously in the supply chain, but what's kind of on the small end, on the large end? Is there a certain niche you're looking for? Is it really any kind of manufacturing or supply chain uh, participant? What, yeah. what are you, what's the ideal area? So while our software is uh, very standard and applies across industries um, uh, without any modification. So, uh, you know, you could have a high tech company and you could also have a, a CPG company use our software without, uh, you know, any modifications. Our company level focus, though, is on a set of uh, ICPs and we're very laser focused on them. So um, high tech, automotive and heavy machinery, um, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, um, aerospace and defense, and increasingly the U.S. federal government. Um, the common theme across all of these uh, industries for us is uh, large organizations, complex supply chains that are global. Um, and overlap uh, of supply chains within industries and across our ICPs. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I know there was a lot of people never even really thought about supply chain until COVID and then there was supply chain issues. And then all of a sudden it was on everybody's mind and they're like, yeah. man, what is going on? Why can't I get, you know, basic products that they just take for granted that are always there and I feel that a lot of people started thinking about it differently and business owners mm -hmm. certainly should probably think about it differently on making sure they're able to manage that risk and do what they need to make sure they're delivering for their, their customers, mm -hmm. whoever that might be in the chain. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we have seen a transformation, right? Between 2010 and 20, uh, end of 2019, uh, it was very much an education that we would do with customers. Uh, but now uh, the mindset in corporations has changed. Um, uh, the initiatives are coming tops down for risk management and risk mitigation uh, from the board level down, as opposed to, you know, in the old days when, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody who had dealt with it before or felt the pain of a disruption tried to bring it into the organization. So that mindset change has happened. I think organizations have understood that uh, supply chain disruptions are not an if anymore, but more of a when. Um, they are also understanding now that um, you know those so-called black swan events, you know the ones that happen once in a while, once in a lifetime things, are no longer black swan because they happen all the time. Um, yeah. Right. Um, we started with the pandemic. Then the Russians invaded uh, Ukraine, right? And that caused an enormous amount of damage to infrastructure that was critical to so many industries. Um, hurricanes are getting bigger, stronger. Uh, the season lasts longer. It's just endless. Yeah, it is. I, I feel the same way with the, with the cyber breach. It used to be that we were doing so much education. I almost was thinking, man, we got into the business too early because I felt like we were yeah. constantly educating. And I heard from a mentor uh, not too long ago. He's like, if I, I'm allergic to any business that requires you to educate the customer, I was like, man, that, is, that makes so much sense. Um, yeah. Fortunately, I guess, unfortunately, but now I feel probably the same way you do. People are starting to yeah. recognize just like supply chain, you know, the world's in chaos with, with war, 
uh, other political things, natural disasters, and certainly cybersecurity. At this point, it's not even if there's going to be a data breach, it's going to be when. We, we see that with our existing customers. They have data breaches all the time. And they have even the ones with the best security stacks. And then it's just a matter of having that amazing team that's able to respond and get it out and you know take the actions. I'm sure it's exactly like that with the supply chain. You know, cybersecurity is a component yep. of that. There's all these other risks completely compounding it. You need to have those relationships. You need to have that network of strong partnerships mm -hmm. that you're able and, and, and plans and backup plans to keep the business moving forward. Because like you said, in the example of Clorox or, or Toyota, and those are probably some of the bigger examples, but if you're a smaller company, you know, that, that it might not be as big monetarily hit, but percentage wise of your revenue, it might be just as big. The impact can be just as bad. And the destruction of the business is 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 just as catastrophic. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, here's one thing that most companies uh, don't get, right? Um, whether you're a small company, large company, you have a cyber breach, your manufacturing shuts down, your customers might actually move on from you. Um, if you are shut down for a longer period of time, and research has shown this, right? The impact to your business is not temporary. It is actually multi-year. So imagine a situation where you're down and your customer has to uh, you know, find a new supplier and they sign a three-year contract with that new supplier. You're out of luck for three years now. So that impact is no longer for a, a few days or weeks or what have you. It's going to be ongoing with, uh, for you. And imagine the consequences to your brand. This is a cyber breach you're talking about, right? It, 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 it's not like, okay, uh, you know, we had a flood, we can't do anything about it or couldn't have done anything about it. It's a cyber breach. Yeah, that, that's huge. I, I, there's, so there's a company, uh, we do a lot in the post-acute space outside of the hospital, any kind of healthcare, we do a lot of work in there. And there's one company I'm thinking of, they had spent years marketing, being in, you know, the magazines, being at the events, and they had grown their business very large. And they had also, it was also a ransomware. It shut down, they were doing cloud infrastructure hosting for their customers, and all their customers went down, all the data was lost, not even recoverable. I don't even know how they survived that event, but they have survived it. But now their name's like a dirty word. Right. Their yeah. brand, who's going to want to go there? They can, you know, tell a story of how they've improved things. But I would think if I was an owner of a business, there'd be no way that I would ever want to, to take that risk. Yeah. Yeah. Completely yeah. agree. Uh, and, and, you know, you know um, as much as we talk about uh, these IT hacks, it's the, the OT side of it. If you were to ask me what keeps me awake at night, that's what really is of concern, right? All the control systems that go into the shop floors, the warehouses, distribution centers, so much of it is so old. Um, you know, so much of it, uh, as much, and again, we also hear this, right? Oh, yeah, I have an air gap between my IT and OT systems. Um, come on. Uh, we know that's not the case always. And, um, you know, those traditional honeypot attacks can easily help you cross over between that gap if, if that gap even was there in the first place. The, the problem with those um, those control systems is, uh, yes, um, a, a, a hacker could lock them up for profit, but also you could have a situation where because they control physical systems, you could create, you know, the hacker could actually cause physical harm. And that's a big issue, right? Um, and and uh, you could actually, um, you know, cause physical harm to a factory, shutting it down for a long period. Worse, you could actually impact health for people who work at the factory and people around the factory. Man, definitely something something to think about. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on, on it. It was a great conversation. How do people, if they want to follow up with you, where can they find you? Where, where can they connect with you? Um, so... You can go to our company website, www.resilink.com. Um, 
you want to talk to me personally, uh, my email address is svakil, S-V-A-K-I-L, at razalink.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sumit. And I look forward to, to, to many more conversations and staying in contact with you. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much for having me uh, on your show. This, this, I had a great time today. Awesome. Me too. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye.